And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We are so pleased to have her. She um, came all the way from Atlanta on her way to LA um, and made a stop off um, just to be here with us today. So we're so excited that she's here. Dr. Terry Ellis is an assistant professor at Boston University, College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, and the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Trainer. She is also the director of the Center for Neurorehabilitation at Boston University, and the director of the American Parkinson's Disease Association National Rehabilitation Resource Center at Boston University. And her research focuses on investigating the impact of exercise and rehabilitation on the progress of disability in individuals with Parkinson's disease. We're so happy to have her. Okay. Hello, everybody. How are you? All right. Well, thanks for coming. I'm so happy to see so many people are very, very interested in exercise. That's great news. How many here are exercising regularly? Okay. Okay. So, you know, is, is, is exercise, is physical therapy beneficial for people with Parkinson's disease? I think everybody here in this room knows the answer to that. Look at this graph I wanted to share with you. Look at the number, the increase in the number of studies that we've seen over the last decade or so. And this ends in 2007. We've seen even a steeper increase. And these studies, most of these studies are, are looking at the benefits of physical therapy or the benefits of some sort of exercise for people with Parkinson's disease, showing resounding effects, many benefits of exercise. In pe for people with Parkinson's disease. So this is exciting that this is getting so much more attention and there's so much more work going into this area because it's, exercise is such an important part of the management of Parkinson's disease over one's lifetime. Okay, so what impact does exercise have on Parkinson's disease? Have you guys all heard about the animal models, the studies that have been done on mice and even monkeys with Parkinson's disease? Did you know that? No, well, there's been some exercise studies done on animals that have helped us learn more about what is the impact of exercise in, you know, in, in Parkinson's disease. And in these animal models, what they have found in this research is some, sometimes the animals have an increase in dopamine availability with exercise. And in other studies, they found an increased release of these uh, chemicals in the brain that are thought to be protective of, uh, of the cells that are dying with Parkinson's disease. So there's been many studies in this area, but the, the overall, so the main message is that there's some evidence to suggest that exercise in the animal model might slow the progression of Parkinson's. Okay, this is in animals. So now, we don't know definitively if, the, if exercise slows down the progression of the disease in humans because we don't have a good way of measuring that in the brain, right? We can't count the number of cells in that, the part of the brain that's affected by Parkinson's disease, right? The midbrain, the substantia nigra. We can't count those cells, right? So in, in humans, right, we don't have a sensitive enough test to do that. So we don't really know for sure if exercise slows down the progression of the disease, but we, we, we have lots of evidence showing that exercise slows the rate of disability, right? So exercise keeps people with Parkinson's disease functioning at a higher level for longer periods of time, right? And the good news, the very good news about exercise is even though we don't have all the definitive answers about exercise that we want to have, not unlike drugs, right? We don't have to wait. In exercise, we don't have to wait for FDA approval, right? You can exercise now. It's freely available to you, right? I wouldn't be waiting, all right? So let's talk more about the specifics. So what does this mean for you? Right? Is this the kind of exercise that you want to be engaged in? Because this is what we, this is what was found in the animal models, right? So let's see. Look, let's look right here. So we can see here that we've learned that exercise is good for overall brain health, right? When you exercise, more blood goes to the brain, 
There's important chemicals in the blood that get to the brain when you exercise. There's more oxygen and glucose in the brain. And all of these things are good for everybody. Okay, and then over here, there are actually some structural changes that happen in the brain with exercise. Right, there's been studies that show better communication between the neurons, more synapses forming. Okay, and then when you get down here, all of these things lead to improved circuitry. So we think that some of the important things about exercise, there's a couple important things. We think that aerobic exercise is really important. That's really important for brain health. When you do aerobic exercise or exercise that gets your heart rate up, we get better blood supply to the brain. Okay, and that's really important. We also think that it's really important to practice a particular task. So, for example, if you're having trouble with walking, or you want to just preserve your, your ability to walk, or the quality of your walking, then it's actually important to practice walking, to actually practice the task. Because we think that we can actually influence the circuitry here by practicing that important behavior. All right, we're going to talk some more about that. Okay, so this is the big question you brought up earlier. What kind of exercise is best for people with Parkinson's disease? Everybody asks me that. Everybody wants to know the one thing, the very one type of exercise that's just perfect to do. Well, there are important components of exercise, and these, there's, so there's many important aspects of exercise. There's not just one single thing that we can say is the best kind of exercise. Some to some degree, it depends on your profile. It depends on, the, on your challenges. It depends on the signs and symptoms that you have related to your Parkinson's disease. Because we, as we know with Parkinson's disease, it affects everybody so differently, right? Everybody knows that. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, here are the important parts of exercise, okay? There's cardiovascular exercise or aerobic training, Okay, that's exercise that gets your heart rate up. We'll talk more about each of these things. There's strength training, right, where you're actually sort of uh, doing some sort of weight training, using some kind of weights, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There's balance training that's very important to reduce fall risk, okay? And then there's stretching, particularly for people who have lots of stiffness and rigidity. Okay, and then there's this, what we call this task-specific training, or focusing on practice of the actual task, things like walking, and standing up from a chair, and moving in bed, those kinds of things that help to improve your ability to do those kinds of tasks. Okay, so let's take each one of these. Let me tell you about the important pieces of each one of these. How's that? You ready for that? Okay. So then a lot of people say, a lot of people ask me, well, what kind of cardiovascular exercise? What's the best kind to do? Well, we, it doesn't seem to matter. Right now, based on the evidence we have, it doesn't seem to matter the kind of cardiovascular exercise you do. It just matters that you get your heart rate up, that you're sweating, that you're working hard, right? And so for people who like to walk, who can get their heart rate up walking, whether that's walking outside or whether it's walking on the treadmill, that's a really good choice. Treadmill walking is actually very beneficial for some people with Parkinson's disease because how many have ever noticed that when you walk, right, you start to slow down over time, right? You start off okay, and then do you notice that your walking kind of slows or peters out? with time, right? So it's hard to keep that pace. Well, the treadmill, what happens? That belt is moving, right? If you're gonna stay on that treadmill, what has to happen? You gotta walk faster, right? And you gotta keep that pace, right? And you, and the treadmill sort of forces you to keep a more brisk walking pace for a longer period of time, right? So you only wanna walk on the treadmill, though, if it's safe for you. Right, if you have adequate balance, and if you don't have freezing, sometimes people who freeze can have trouble with the treadmill. Well, that's where the bike comes in. The bike can be a really good idea and a really good option for people who freeze when they walk and have trouble getting an aerobic exercise with walking, right? So a stationary bike, for example, 
is a good way to get a aerobic exercise. Okay, so let's see. This is just some data showing uh, the, the benefits of treadmill training for people with Parkinson's disease. People who trained and walked on the treadmill here had faster gait speed at the end of a period of training, okay, compared to people with Parkinson's who didn't walk on the treadmill. Okay, so this, is a, this was a study done um, by a group in Chicago, and they looked at just walking outside. So people with Parkinson's disease who walked for 45 minutes three times a week over a six month period had gains in lots of different areas. In oxygen uptake, so in the efficiency of the use of oxygen, in walking speed, even the Parkinson's symptoms were better. And then even things like thinking, cognition, right? Thinking was better with aerobic exercise, which makes sense, right? Because you're getting that blood to the brain and those important chemicals to the brain. And then people even experienced improvements in fatigue, less fatigue. Oh, yeah, less fatigue. We get this thing going in the right direction. Less fatigue and right to the other way. Okay, right here. All right. Okay, so lots of benefits to walking. Lots of benefits to walking. Now, people always ask me, well, how intense does this aerobic exercise need to be? Well, the intensity is different for everybody, right? Everybody's level of intensity will be different depending on your starting point, right? If you watch the guys who, um, who run, I'm from Boston, right? So the Boston Marathon is big, right? So the guy who runs the Boston Marathon and wins the Boston Marathon is running at his highest intensity. Well, that's not mine. A couple hours later, when I finish, right, that was my highest intensity, right? So I'm pushing myself as much as I can. So the, the, so the intensity for each individual should be just beyond your sort of current capabilities, right? So if you're just doing exercise and cruising along and it's easy, well, then you're probably not working hard enough. You've got to work a little bit beyond your comfort zone. You should be sweating. You should be, a, it should be a little bit out of breath when you try to talk. Okay? This is where a physical therapist can be very, very helpful in if you, I'm going to talk a lot about seeing a physical therapist, but this is where a physical therapist can help you find that just right level of intensity that's really important to achieve. Okay. All right. So let's go to strengthening. So let's go to resistance training, strengthening. This is another one of those areas where the just right intensity matters, right? If I, if I want to strengthen my biceps, right? Everybody knows that, right? With the biceps in the front here, right? If I just say, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick up this cup of coffee a bunch of times and strengthen my biceps, well, that's not going to work, right? Because that's too easy. So I have to find that just right amount of weight to help me strengthen the key muscles that are important in Parkinson's disease. So there was a study done by another group in Chicago, and they did a study, and they had people with Parkinson's disease doing some weight training for two years, over a two-year period of time. And there were two different groups. One of them lifted weights about the same amount for two years. It didn't progress. And then the other group of people with Parkinson did the weight training and the, and the weights continued to progress or increase over the course of two years. And what they found in that study is a significant difference in the end. The people with Parkinson's who participated in the progressive resistance program had a better outcome uh, their, their Parkinson's signs, you know these things that the neurologist has you do, right? Every time you go to the doctor, right? Those things got better. The speed of movement got better, all right? So there, was, there were many aspects of the program that were better for people that had a progressive program, okay? That increased their intensity over time. Okay, so then where do you focus that strengthening? What, what are the particular muscle groups? Well, it's the muscle groups in, generally in the back, right? The back here, the buttocks, the legs, 
It's called the extensor muscles, the muscles that hold you up. Okay, those are the important ones to focus on with a strengthening program. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. It turns out the good news with strengthening program is you don't need any fancy equipment. If you want to go to the gym, you can go to the gym. But there's a lot you can do with strengthening that's high enough intensity by just using body weight. Just using body weight, no equipment. This can be done easily at home. And you just see an example here of different levels of exercise, different levels of intensity. This is a gentleman getting up from the chair, sit to stand from the chair. And this is somebody that's doing the same movement but not coming down all the way to the chair. Okay, and this is someone that's coming down even a little bit further with their arms out, okay, and that makes it just a little bit harder. So there's a progression of strengthening exercises that can be done to make sure people are working at the just right level. So you want to, this, I'll, I'll talk about this at the end. Um, so you want to keep in mind that you don't have to do a separate strengthening exercise for every key muscle that we want to target. When you do an exercise like this, you're actually getting all of those muscle groups that we talked about that are important in Parkinson's. The ones in the back and the ones in the legs, right? So it doesn't take a lot necessarily, but it has to be specific, specific to those important muscles. And then what about range of motion or flexibility? Particularly for those people who have stiffness because of rigidity and for people who have pain pain in the shoulder, pain in the hip, sometimes pain in the back, can be helped by some of these uh, flexibility exercises. So here are some pictures of some examples of the key, some of the key strengthening, uh, some of the key stretching exercises that are important. For people with Parkinson's disease, you guys know, right, there's a tendency to come forward in the posture, right? The posture can be a little bit more flexed, and so when we look at that posture, we can tell, okay, what are the muscle groups that are at risk of getting too short, getting too stiff, right? And we can see that just by that posture. So we can then teach you the specific exercises, the specific stretching exercises you need to make sure you stay up tall, right? And, and have the adequate muscle length to, to assume that upright posture and to help with whatever specific issues you have with a shoulder or a hip or a back. That can be very important. Okay, and then there is balance exercises. Who doesn't need balance exercises, right? So balance exercises are important particularly to decrease risk of falls or decrease frequency of falls. We want to do everything we can to reduce fall risks. That's important in, in, in older adults in general Right? And it's, specific, it's particularly important in people with Parkinson's disease. So there's been a lot of different studies done in the area of balance. So here's one I'll share with you on Tai Chi. Is there anybody here who participates in Tai Chi? Yeah. All right, great, a few of you here. So Tai Chi, there was a big study published uh, a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine talking about the benefits of Tai Chi for people with Parkinson's disease. So they compared Tai Chi to strengthening, to stretching, and now stre strengthening and stretching are good for their, for their own reasons, but if you want to target balance, Tai Chi has been actually found to be effective, more effective than some other things, in improving balance, okay, and reducing fall risk, right? We think that if we improve balance, we can reduce people's risk of falling. And Tai Chi is one of the options. And then there has been studies done on the tango. Who, who's done the tango in here? Well, all right. And, and, if, and I'm, I'm sure you know Dr. Dr. Earhart, who is here, is going to speak right after me, is the person who, who I don't even know where to begin. She, she developed this whole program on the tango and studied it, and studied it extensively. Okay, so this is a lot of the work in this area is, has come right from here, from Wash U, in this group. And so in the tango, they've done studies here where in this particular study, 62 people with Parkinson's participated in the tango over a one year period of time. And they saw improvements in the Parkinson's symptoms, so these kinds of things, right? The Parkinson's symptoms, 
and improvements in balance and walking and reduced freezing and better quality of life. And the good thing about the tango is not only does it improve all these things, but it can be fun, right? It can be a fun way to, uh, to work on balance. Okay, and then here's a key message. This, this is a big study on balance that was, uh, that was conducted in Australia. So they had, they had uh, 231 people with Parkinson's disease participate in this balance program. Most of the program was, was carried out by people with Parkinson's in their home. They came to a supervised exercise session once a month over six months, but mostly they did it at home three times a week. And they did balance and strengthening exercises, and there was tips to reduce freezing. And one of the key messages in this study here is that the biggest impact that the study had was on people with Parkinson's that had less disease severity or that were earlier on in the disease process. Sometimes people think that they have to wait. Oh, I don't have a problem with balance. I'm not falling, or I've only had a couple falls. It's no big deal, right? Well, it turns out that that's when we can do a lot to help. So it's really good to be doing balance exercises early in the process even if you don't think you have a balance problem, or even if you've only fallen a couple times, okay? Now, of course, we can help people late in the later stages that are falling a lot, but the key message here is that it's really important to, to, be, to be focusing on this early. And then there was another study done in Australia with 210 people with Parkinson's disease, and they found over a six month, 12 month period, this was one year, they found a significant reduction in the number of falls with strength training, so resistance training, and this movement strategy training, which is a lot like the task-based practice, practicing the actual skills of getting in and out of bed, standing up from a chair, those kinds of things. So both of these programs led to a significant reduction in falls, particularly the strengthening one. So, let me just tell you something. You, this, some of you might be thinking, oh, geez, cardiovascular training, and then I have to do strengthening, and then I have to do stretching, and then there's balance training. When am I going to fit this in? How am I going to do this? They don't all have to be done, not all of them have to be done every day, and they can be combined, for example. So if I do something just as simple as, let me just show you, just, just this. If I'm doing just something like this and coming up and down like this in this particular stance, I can be working on strengthening those extensor muscles in the legs and challenging my balance at the same time. So it's a twofer, right? So you don't have to do separate things for every bucket, but actually some of them can be combined. If you're walking on a treadmill, you're working on aerobic training and the practice of walking at the same time, right? And for some people, it might even be balance training. Okay? So it's really, it, this is where seeing a physical therapist, a physical therapist with expertise in Parkinson's disease, which is really, really important. For some reason, everybody knows that doctors specialize, right? Everybody knows that, right? There's doctors, you guys all know that? Doctors that specialize in Parkinson's disease. And so you want to see a doctor who's a movement disorder specialist, who specializes in Parkinson's disease, because they have lots of expertise in this area. Well, it's the same theme for physical therapists. Physical therapists specialize, and they have areas of expertise. So you, when you look for a physical therapist, you want to look for someone that has experience or expertise in Parkinson's disease. Some physical therapists are even board certified in neurology. So you could ask for someone, I would like to see a physical therapist who's board certified in neurology. You can say that. And then you're much more likely to find someone who has expertise in Parkinson's, who can then help you figure out what is the, how do you take all of those exercise recommendations and tailor them to you based on your uh, goals and your challenges, right? That's how we can optimize the benefits of exercise. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Here. Here's a, here's a graph that's looking at the, the important aspects of exercise, right? This table. So what this tells us is that in animal models and in humans, it seems like the type of exercise matters less than perhaps the intensity of the exercise. So in other words, in order for the exercise to be most beneficial, it has to be intense enough. It has to be specific enough. It has to be challenging enough. You have to be sort of working at it enough, right? And don't forget, that's a different level for everybody, right? What one person can do, another person needs to be doing something differently. So these, this is important, and this is where a physical therapist can help you tailor the exercise to you. Okay, so, what's the time? Just want to make sure. 10.30? Okay, so, and then, you know, some people that come to see me in my clinic, some people say to me, I give them an exercise program, show them what to do, give them videos or pictures, or whatever it is, right? They're all set, and you know what sometimes they say to me? So how long do I have to do this? <laughs> how long? Right? What's the answer? Forever. Forever. Right? Forever. This is not a short-term fix. Right? Now, exercise forever is true for everybody. Right? It's true for the whole world. Right? But in Parkinson's disease, we want the exercise to be specific. To the, to the challenges that people with Parkinson's disease face, right? And so we, we actually, did, just in case you're not convinced, right? We actually did a study way back. Um, this was actually done a long, in 2005 when I did my dissertation. And I'm showing this because I, I can pick on myself, all right? When we did this study here, we, uh, we had people with Parkinson's disease. See this red line there? They participated in a group treatment, okay, twice a week for six weeks, okay, a group treatment. And look what would happen to their comfortable walking speed over six weeks. It got a lot better. It got a lot better. And the people, the green group here, they didn't participate in the, in the program yet. They were just sitting out waiting for their turn, okay? And then six weeks later, look what happened. The green group, they started the program. And look what happened to their walking speed. What happened? It went up, it got faster. Now, right here, this group stopped the program, this group stopped the program, and then we measured again at three months. And what happened to three months? They started to go down, right? Now, this is not shocking. Right? This is not shocking. Once you stop the exercise, right, then you're going to have a decline in function. So we need to, thankfully, look what happened here. You know what the good news is? Is that at three months, people were still better than they were at the beginning. That was a good thing for my dissertation. Right? That was a good thing. <laughs> so here, we know from the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines that if you discontinue training, Gains in fitness regress by approximately 50% in 4 to 12 weeks. So how many people have gone to the gym in January and February and quit by March, right, with their New Year's resolutions? Right, so all the gains you made in January and February are gone by the end of March. Right, so we have to figure out ways to keep people doing this over the long term. It's going to be a lifestyle change. So here, what this shows is, in general, People with Parkinson's disease tend to be less active than older adults of the same age without Parkinson's disease. Okay? They tend to be less active overall, and we don't want that. We followed people with Parkinson's disease over a year. And what we had them wear a monitor, an activity monitor on their leg, so we could see how active they were. And what we found over the course of a year without any intervention, so we didn't provide any intervention, we just followed people over time, we found that people with Parkinson's disease walked 12% less, so took 12% fewer steps, right, every day over the course of a week 
from, from, from when we first measured him to a year later. Okay, so there was a 12% reduction in the physical activity level, okay, measured by measuring walking, okay, over the course of one year. And you know what's important about this data? Is that the, the, the Parkinson scores, this, this scores here, the, the scores that we use to, to mark the severity of the disease, the severity of the disease stayed the same over the year. The Parkinson's medicines went up a little bit. The Parkinson's symptoms stayed stable. That means that people were well managed medically, that they were holding their own, that the disease was, was not progressing very quickly, right? But despite that, despite doing well with the Parkinson's disease, people just started moving less. Right? They started becoming less and less active. And we don't want that. The good news is, 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 is this is very modifiable. If we look, well, I'll come to that in a second. I'll come to that in a second. And so, if you look at this study here, this is data that shows, you see these dark circles at the bottom? Those dark circles are people who had no walking problems. Okay, their walking was in good shape. And this is, a, this is a marker of disability here on, on the y-axis over here. And so what this shows is the people in the dark circles that whose walking was pretty good had less disability. And people up here with the open circles that had problems with walking had more disability. And so the message here is that we want to target walking. We want to help people with Parkinson's improve walking. We want to tackle walking earlier in the process. And, what, and the even better news is that it, we find that it's modifiable. It's modifiable. We're finding that people with Parkinson's disease are quite capable of increasing their activity level by quite a bit, right? So this is, this is something that you can take control of. This is something you can work on and get better at. It's possible to actually increase your activity level. Right? And then if you increase your activity level, that means better function, better quality of life, less disability. Okay? Okay, so let's get that. And then there was a survey done by, um, by some folks at the University of Florida. They actually asked people with Parkinson's disease, what is important to you? What should we be focusing treatment on? And, uh, and a lot, and those people with Parkinson's who participated in this survey said that walking was one of the most important things. That preserving walking and having good walking function was really important. And so we want to actually focus on that. So how do you focus on it? How do you help walking? Because, you know, people have difficulty walking, right? The shuffling steps and that destination and the slowness that happens. So how do we actually tackle walking? Okay, so here, let's try this. So we can use, how many have ever walked with a metronome or with music and found that to be helpful in improving walking? We're going to see if this video works. So here's a gentleman with Parkinson's disease walking without music. Do you notice the difference in the walking, the guy on the right, with the music? Okay, let me see it. See, he's got more get up and go, right? His steps are bigger. He's more symmetrical. You see those arms swinging? Because he's in training, he's in training to the beat. Can you hear that? Can you hear that?
They divided people into two groups, a group, a group that exercised sufficiently and a group that didn't. And then they measured them, they, they, they looked at their, some of the other data at one year. So one year later, they looked and they found that people that were exercising regularly, which was at least 150 minutes a week, so that's 30 minutes a day, five days a week, people that were doing at least that had better quality of life, mobility, physical function, and cognition or thinking one year later compared to people with Parkinson's that were inactive or, or not exercising enough, okay? And the, the progression of the disease was less one year later. So out of all this data I've been sharing with you today, there is clearly, clearly more and more and more evidence showing the benefits of, of physical activity and exercise for people with Parkinson's disease. So then, I think everybody's convinced, right? Exercise is great, gotta be doing it. Now you know all the important parts of exercise. Now you know the importance of intensity and, and being challenged. Then the big question is how to do it, how to fit it in, how to actually make it real. How do you integrate this in your everyday life? And Dr. Earhart is gonna spend her talk talking a lot about that today. We're gonna touch briefly in some of this, the work that our groups have done together at Wash U and Boston University, we have found here that, some, that there are some uh, barriers to exercise that we can actually work on. And so, you know, what, what we learned from these studies, when we, we did studies following people over time, 266 people with Parkinson's disease, and we, we looked at people who were exercising and looked at people that weren't, and tried to identify what are the differences between the groups? What are some of the reasons that separate the groups. And something called self-efficacy was so it rose to the top. And self-efficacy is confidence. So some people with Parkinson's disease had a lot of confidence in their ability to exercise well and, 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 and exercise regularly. And, and with that confidence, people were doing it, were exercising regularly. But then there were some people with Parkinson's disease who had lower self-efficacy or lower confidence in their ability to exercise successfully, and they tended to do it less, right? And so we learned that self-efficacy is, is an important thing for us to be able to work on. Somehow we have to sort of, uh, you know, collaborate with people with Parkinson's disease and talk about ways to make this happen and increase people's confidence and make exercise attainable and make sure it's specific and individualized to that person so that those people can be successful at exercising. The biggest reason why people keep exercising is because you feel the benefits yourself, right? If you feel the benefits yourself, that's the best reason to keep doing it. But it takes a while. You, it takes a while to feel those benefits. You're not gonna just exercise for a week and then say, I don't feel the benefits. You know, it takes a while. Right? It takes a couple months, two or three months of regular exercise to reap the benefits. Okay, so here's the message I'm going to sort of conclude with here. We, so, uh, I have ten minutes? Okay, good. Okay, so, um, how many people in this room have seen a physical therapist specifically for Parkinson's disease? Okay, I would say that's probably about half, maybe a little bit more than half. And out of those people who saw a physical therapist, how, uh, of that group, how many saw somebody, a physical therapist with expertise in Parkinson's disease? Okay, so that's probably half of the people who rose their hand, raised their hand and said they went to a physical therapist. Okay, so look at this. This unfortunately happens still. And we don't want this to happen. This model here, where people can, people with Parkinson's disease have symptoms of Parkinson's for quite a while before diagnosis, right? It's only looking back that you say, oh, geez, probably had this for a couple of years or so, right? And so those couple of years goes by before you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And sometimes you might start on medication right away, sometimes not, okay, a couple of years later. But some people, don't get referred or don't go to physical therapy until there's like a big problem. 
until there's like overt disability or there's a fall or a big problem emerges. And then people will go to a physical therapist. Well, that's okay if you, we want you to come to a physical therapist, but earlier, earlier is the key. And so what happens here is sometimes we see people, we see them for a bunch of visits, and then we discharge them with a home program, a home exercise program. But when we give people a home exercise program, what tends to happen? Yeah, I heard a resounding, you stop. So I guess people have experience with that. They give you a home exercise program, you do it for a couple of weeks, and then all of a sudden it's not happening as much. That's not a good model. That's not a good model in our healthcare system. So what we have been proposing, and what we do in our clinic, and what happens here at this clinic at Wash U, right, is that we see people with Parkinson's disease at the point of diagnosis. So when people are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, they come to see a physical therapist. Because a physical therapist spends time measuring things that the doctor doesn't have time to measure. A physical therapist looks way more in depth at things like walking and balance and, and, and assesses risk for falling and all of these really important things that should happen early. And then what happens is, now, who, did anyone, did anyone ever like uh, question whether you should go back and see your neurologist? Right, you go back to see your neurologist, what, every three, six months, a year, whatever it is. Why? Why do you go back? Well, you have to be reassessed, and then you have to see how you're doing, and then you have to decide if you need a medication adjustment, right? To see, do your medications have to be adjusted? Well, guess what? Your exercise program needs to be adjusted. Right, you can't just have one exercise program for life. Right, we talked about how it has to be challenging. It has to fit your profile. It has to address the specific problems that you have. Right, it has to be tailored to you to have the best outcome. So what we propose, what we recommend people do is that you go to a physical therapist regularly. You know, every six months or so, or a year, or three months, depends on what you need, okay? And you know what happens, you come back and then they can measure progress or changes with gait and balance and whatever, bed mobility and standing up from a chair and stairs and all of these kinds of things. And then if there's a problem, they can intervene early, right? So that you can have the best possible outcome. We sometimes, we call this the dental model, right? The dental model. Do you go to the dentist every six months or every year or so and you have a regular checkup? Right? And they say, oh, oh, you know, oh, yeah, great job flossing and brushing your teeth, right? And exercising, right? Those are the things you want to hear. And, and the best news is if the dentist says, oh, there's no problems, you're doing great, keep doing it. Great! Right? That's perfect, that's what you want to hear. But if the dentist finds a problem early, they can intervene early, right? They can intervene early and have a better outcome and cost a lot less. To for the dentist, right? So that's the kind of model that we're proposing for physical therapy. But again, it has to be with an expert, somebody who has expertise. And so we are just about to embark on a study. So even here, we oh, so even here, there's a, even here in between this six month period when you're not seeing a physical therapist, in between here, this is when, so a physical therapist will give people an exercise program, right? They give you specific information about what to do. There's also, this is where the community classes also come into play. You're going to hear more about boxing later today. You're going to hear, I already talked a little bit about Tai Chi. You're going to hear more about tango, okay? And those are all things that you can do in between your physical therapy visits to participate in exercise. But the physical therapist can help can help guide you as to what would be the best program for you, right, given your set of challenges. So even with that, we're always looking for other ways to help people exercise. And so we, we just put in a brief grant to so NIH mind, that we're, we're, we're hoping, it's, it's, we just got a good score, we're hoping it gets funded. And we're going to be working 
with people with Parkinson's disease to try to get them to continue to exercise over the course of the long term. And we're going to be focusing on improving walking ability. And we're going to do that using some mobile health technology. So listen to this. What if you could come to the clinic and we could video you? We video the specific exercise program that you should be doing, right? And then what if, how many people here have a smartphone? Okay, great. How many people have an iPad? Okay, how many people have a computer? Uh, see, it's not everybody now. Okay, great. Okay, so now, what if we, and even if you don't have one, we're going to give you one, a tablet to take home in this particular study. And so, what if you took your tablet or your smartphone and you went home and you had the exercise program right there? You just click on it and it plays the exercise. Let me show you. Uh, Okay, so what if you just click on the app there? Oh, let's see. Let's see. Um, okay. So what if you open the app and then you see yourself? We video you doing the exercise. What if you could see yourself exercising? And then you hear the physical therapist talking, giving you the instructions as to what to do and how to do it to make sure the quality is good. And then they tell you how many to do. And then when you're done doing the exercise, you see that button there, that orange button? You just hit, I did it. And when you hit, I did it, we ask you a couple questions. Was it easy? Was it hard? Was it painful? Was it painless? And based on that data, you can also chat to us. You can chat a little message. There's a text feature. You could chat to us, and then you know what happens? We see this data. We see this data remotely. So we can see if you're doing your exercises. <laughs> and the best thing is, is based on your responses, if I see you've been doing an exercise regularly and it's getting too easy, remotely, remotely, we can take that exercise away and supplement it with a harder one. One that's just a little bit more challenging in the just right place. And that, that doesn't require you to come in for another visit, right? We could do that remotely, and then you come and get a checkup every six months or so, and we make sure you're on track and do those measures again. How's that sound? Good. Woo, all right, well, we'll be letting you know if we get this, because then we're gonna, we want everybody here to participate. That would be great. Okay, because without you participating, we can't learn whether this is work, whether this works, right? We need your input, we need your help. Okay, and so here is a guy, here's just the last thing. Here's a guy, he was in his 50s, and he had it was uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Here's just a here's an example about how he fit exercise into his life. He decided he was going to do a brisk walk two mornings a week in the after he was working full time. And he was a property manager, so he did a lot of driving from place to place. And he decided he was going to go to the gym at lunch three days a week. That's when he did his aerobic training, and he's 30 minutes of aerobic training, and he did 20 minutes of strengthening and balance training at lunch three days a week. Okay? And then on the off days, he did a little stretching, and on the weekend, he did a lot of recreational activities with his family, which kept him active. So this is just an example of how he fit it into his life, and how he got all the major components of the exercise in, right? He was just, his, his exercise program, uh, uh, you know, entailed all the important aspects of exercise. And then look at what happened. We followed him, this is just his annual data. This is data over four years. We look at his balance and his walking speed and his walking endurance. And even without knowing what these numbers mean, you can just see that they're pretty stable. They're stable over that four year period. So he's doing well, right? Keeping stable is good, right? We don't want to decline. We want people to hold their own. And so this is some of the things that you can do with your physical therapist. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna let, there's, there's a, if you want to get started with exercise or you want something to supplement your own exercise program, <laughs> the American Parkinson's Disease Association has a free exercise booklet 
I know because I'm one of the people who wrote it. Right? And so you can get this free. You can just go on the website for the APDA and you can download that for free or you can have them mail it to you for free. Okay? And then you know those pictures I showed you earlier of the stretching and the strengthening exercises? Those are right from this book. Right? So you can get them right from the book for free. And then as the National Rehab Resource Center, we get some funding from the APDA and we have a, a telephone and an email helpline. So if you have any questions about today's talk, well, the people that I work with are going to be, that any questions about today's talk, you can email me here at rehab, oh, at rehab, right here, rehab at the U edu, or you can call this toll-free 188 number anytime and ask any exercise-related questions you have. It will help to answer those. Also, if you're looking for a physical therapist with expertise in Parkinson's disease, well, if you live locally, if you live, if you live locally, you have it right here at Wash U. If you don't live locally, you came from far away, you can give us a call. We have a database of people. We can try to find someone who's close to you. Okay?